Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, host of the RouterFlex podcast and founder and CEO of our day job, recruiting firm RouterFlex. We hope you enjoy this episode. And as a reminder, please subscribe to the podcast for updates and news. If you haven't already, check out the series of books we've published on hiring, interviewing, and overall career advice titled The Writer Flex Guide. And finally, today's episode is brought to you by Class 6 Partners. Are you ready to sell your business or raise capital? Class 6 Partners guides you through the entire process, from business optimization to securing the perfect deal. With over $3 billion in transactions, they turn your business dreams into reality. Visit class6partners.com to start your journey today. Cher Fox on the Rider Flex podcast. Hi, Cher. How are you? Hi, Steve. Good. How are you? You know, I, I think I've had like 500 guests on the show. The name Cher Fox has got to be in the top three coolest names so far. Well, thank you. Um, I received the uh, the first name. I came by it somewhat honestly. My mom used to work for Sonny and Cher in the late 60s. Are you serious? I am serious. Uh, oh. My family was actually in music. Uh, my dad was in, he managed bands out of Seattle. Um, has, cool. has a relationship with Ann and Nancy Wilson of heart. Um, I grew up in like this really weird, very young or, uh, music space. And then I married the the last name. So I, I was pretty lucky. It's it's short and sweet. <laughs> it's a very cool name, Sheriff Fox. I mean, if you're trying to brand yourself or you're trying to get people to remember you, especially like on a sales call or a marketing call, I mean, Sheriff Fox, they're going to remember. <laughs> you would think so, but oddly... Cheryl, Sharon, Sherry, it's, it's hard to just stop it at share. So I get called okay. a lot of okay. different things, Char, things of that nature. So it happens. It's okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Why your camera is shaking on me a little bit. What's, what's going on with your camera? Is it, it feels like it, it feels like it's. Might be me on the desk. So I will stop that. Be perfectly still. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> my arms are on the desk so cut all that out and uh no we'll... no no and we got hey man we, we are you kidding me the listeners love us stuff are you kidding me they like the real stuff man i mean i can make it worse there that's really worse there yeah. <laughs> uh okay so you grew up were your parents hippies no they're not really were the hippies or not really no, no, okay. not at all. I mean, my dad uh, was worked in subcontracts for mm -hmm. Boeing and for Rockwell Collins. Okay. Uh, so definitely not not hippie ish at all. Okay. Uh, my mom, she was a stay at home mom. Most of what I remember in life, I she had a brief career before that. But uh, when she had okay. children, uh, raising kids and, uh, you know, working with she worked with me a lot on flashcards and workbooks and things like that. So she was a very right. active mom uh, when I was much, much younger. So are you the only child or did you have siblings? No, I have a brother that is almost eight years younger than me. So we have we have quite a very different experience growing up because, you know, my folks would have been at a different stage in life eight years later. So mm -hmm. yeah, he probably got away with murder compared to you. He did oddly enough. Yeah. And I was, the, I was the good kid, but, um, we, we, I grew up in Seattle until I reached my teen years. And then, uh, my dad left Boeing and went to Rockwell Collins. And so we moved to Iowa, um, which is where I met my husband. I met my husband when I was 12 and he was nine. Um, and my brother was kind of known as the feral child of the neighborhood because everyone had acres of land and my bro you never knew where my brother was. He was always at somebody's house or playing with somebody's toys or, you know, my husband's younger brother and my younger brother were best friends. So our families have been tied together for a very long time. And, uh, my husband will will tell the stories of he's be like, yeah, we're we're out, but we come home and your brother's in our living room in our house with all the toys strewn out. I'm like, yeah, that's my brother, the feral child. You know, for dinner, my mom would be calling all over the neighborhood trying to find Pretty him. So, yeah, wow. he kind of ran a little wild. <laughs> boy, so that's a boy thing. <laughs> so the guy you're married to today, you have known since you guys met in like junior high. Um, so I was 
Uh, I was starting high school and he was in, gosh, I think he eighth grade or something, seventh grade, not even. Yeah. Maybe sixth or seventh grade. I was a senior in high school when he was a freshman. So really now your friends were giving you hell about that. Weren't they? Were like, well, we, did, we never dated all that time. We didn't oh, start, I see. We didn't, oh, we didn't oh, start oh, dating I see. until, uh, in our gosh, in our mid twenties. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. You were just, the, just you known were, each other. You were the hot senior chick. He was a little freshman boy. He's like, oh my God, someday share. <laughs> Maybe he might tell that story. I doubt it. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, how did the dating happen? Did you go off to school? He went to school. How did it, how did you guys like end up connecting? <clears throat> so, you know, we ran into each other a lot after high school. Cause I, I still lived in Iowa um, until I started getting relocated for work, but um, we would run into each other at the gym or at, you know, some bar or something. We would always run into each other, but I was usually dating somebody or, you know, I just, I, I wasn't paying attention. And uh, he actually walked into the wedding reception at a hotel that I was a bridesmaid in and next door was another wedding that he was the, I think he was the best man in it. So he walked in, in a tux, you know, looking fine. <laughs> and, uh, um, he's, you know, I, I don't remember it. I don't know why, but he says I stood up and I like shouted out his name and uh, he ended up uh, like I was at the head table, he yeah. ended up sitting down and talking with my parents. My folks were there because the woman getting married had been my best friend all through high school. And uh, yeah, we just, you know, I, wow. I think he he asked my dad if he could give me a call or my dad tricked me into calling him, I think, actually. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we, we just uh... we yeah, we went out. We went out on our first date. Uh, when I got home, I knew I was going to marry him. So in six Gosh, like six weeks later, we were engaged, and six months after that, we were married. So wow, wow, um, okay. I just cool. knew. <laughs> wow, cool, sto cool story. How many kids? You got kids? No, nope, we didn't have any children. We have had five furry children. So we have adopted some dogs uh, over the years. We're we're down to two now. We've got a, we've got one. She'll be seventeen at the end of September, and then we've Ooh. got um, an eleven and a half year old. He's He's six months behind her and then years. So okay. we've had What's your three at about any point in time. So <laughs> what's your husband do? Uh, so my husband is in real estate development. Um, he has a, he has a really great career um, in like heavy civil engineering construction and stuff like that. So okay. um, he's, He's done a vast, wide, crazy stuff, you know, land developments, neighborhood developments, built roads, bridges, you know, country infrastructure uh, through states and things like that. So, OK. All right. And how did you become the data nista? What, what, how did that even like what? what? <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 start yeah well first of all did you go to school did you did you get your bachelor's or did you, you stopped halfway through school i can't tell but from your linkedin did, well, uh, start, I, there. I, okay. start there okay i did not get my bachelor's um i did start college uh i was accepted into some pretty elite schools uh well, so you were a good kid you were a straight a student i was um you know, it's it's funny because I went to law school with my dad nights when I was a little kid, and I always kind of thought I'd be a lawyer. And then my family was very active um, with raising dogs. And I also, I thought, well, maybe I'll be a vet. And then in high school, we had to dissect a cat for a class. And I, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't even fathom all of formaldehyde and cutting into cats. I'm just like, it's furry. I don't care whether it's dead. I can't do it. I, I rerouted it. into like an advanced biology class um, to circumvent it. We dissected sharks, which coming from Seattle and seafood wasn't a big deal to me. But um, my hey. my dad thought from working, you know, his time at Rockwell Collins, he thought I'd make a really great electrical engineer because I was outgoing and math and science were super strong for me. Um, so I applied to MIT, I applied to Iowa State, um, I applied to uh, University of Washington because I thought about going home um, and doing that. I got into all those really great schools um, and my folks hadn't really planned for it. Um, 
So there wasn't money for me, one, to go out of state. And there wasn't even uh, really money for me to go in state. I got you. Um, and I was, uh, I started I started college at the age of 17, so I couldn't even sign a note for myself for a student loan. I wasn't legal to sign a contract. So I, you know, I'd, I'd had some money scraped up and I, I, you know, hoofed it out to the community college and got going. Um, I had an apartment at the time by myself, which my dad did have to co-sign because I wasn't old enough. I had a car payment. I'm trying to go to school. I'm working three jobs. Um <laughs> <laughs> things dial back on the jobs. I start getting, you know, more and more on a, on a, you know, programmer developer career path. Um, and I, I, I get hired on into this really great company who has amazing tuition reimbursement. And I'm thinking, sweet, I'm gonna be able to go to college on these guys. Um, well, the company that I got hired on to got acquired by another company that was international. Um, my entire team was dissolved. They kept me because I was able to cover for everybody. Plus I was young. I think I was cheap. <laughs> yep, of course. Um, and then, <laughs> and then they started relocating me to like Philadelphia and Chicago to do mergers and acquisitions for them, for other clients. That and were, other were, were you doing, were you doing data? Were you doing data at that time? Or what were you doing fu functionally? Functionally, functionally, I was running a 24 seven help desk. I mean, bottom line, but part of that was supporting the cash management systems uh, and the software that went with the hardware, like cash counters and coin counters and things like that. Um, you know, the money, money in certain industries, it's 24 seven. It doesn't get a day off. You know, one of our one of our uh, companies that we supported was Chicago Transit Authority, and they had this really cool back in the day three-story coin counting system. They would climb up these stairs, dump the coins in at the top from the buses, from the rails, from you know all the places they would collect money. It would filter through this coin counter. It would feed data out to a, a software system. It would separate it, it would wrap it, and then it would dump it into a bag so you could just pick it up and take it to the bank. So, <laughs> you know, just, it was really these kind of major contraptions that they had, but they kept relocating me for all these really fun opportunities. That, you married? You know, were you married during these relocations? Yep. I was okay, just okay. going to say that a young okay, woman okay. in her twenties uh, probably right. doesn't get the opportunity to do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I kept starting semesters and then getting relocated. So nice. they would, they would buy out my semester, but my transcript is a freaking disaster because they did that for four years. Um, they ended up paying, I swear to God, for a master's degree, but I did finish my associates um, before okay. my husband and I left Iowa and moved to Colorado. So I have an associate's degree. Um, I have a certification. I have 35 plus years of experience. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't always get me where I want to go, but you know, the paper ceiling's a real thing. And you know, if that's not as much, as, not as much I, 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 these days, look, mm -hmm. Hey, I have chat GPT on my phone. So as far as I'm concerned, I have a doctorate right here. <laughs> so, I mean, I swear if anyone ever had me like, you know, give their <laughs> keynote at graduation and I could just get the honorary bachelor's, that would help. I mean, that'd be cool. Uh, that'd be cool. I mean, so you live in Denver now. And why, why did you get, why'd you go to Colorado in the first place for a job? Uh, or? So my husband had some family here. Oh, okay. And um, we thought, well, we'll, we'll, we'll move out to Colorado. Um, Iowa, Iowa's a great place to raise kids, grow old, not super fun for a younger couple that's, you know, getting started in their marriage. Yeah, so, sounds right. Yeah. Um, you know, we came out here, we thought we got a little bit of mountains, there's a little bit of water, we're a little more centrally located. Um, we just, we kind of took a chance. We when we, you know, sat down and started throwing darts at, you know, a board, it was Chicago, which Chicago is heavily union. And that would have been tricky for him to have gotten into I see. I see. in the union. Plus it's still cold and it's windy. And it, I mean, yeah. Lake Michigan and downtown is beautiful, but yeah. um, he had some family here. We talked about maybe Oregon. We talked about Seattle. Seattle was a little expensive. It's still a little expensive. So um, okay. we came to visit Colorado a few times and thought, hey, we could, we could make a life here. So um, we moved to just south of Denver and lived there about 10 years. And then we moved to downtown Denver and lived there about 10 years. And now I actually live in the mountains uh, west about two and a half hours outside of Denver. So. Okay, nice. All right. Good for you. <laughs>
Well, when COVID hit, you know, our uh, our condo community was not behaving and um, I'm a little immunocompromised from time to time. So as soon as that hit, we whisked off to the mountains and that was kind of the end of the story. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing this. All right. So you're moving along in your career. Mm -hmm. At what point do you decide I'm going to do my own thing? I'm going to be own my own consulting firm. I'm going to do my own brand. How, how does that even happen? I actually didn't make the decision. Uh, it was decided for me, oddly. Uh, the the company that had acquired the company that I had hired on to um, that was doing all the mergers and acquisitions, they ended up shutting our division down. And because I had been a few places across the States and I'd made a lot of pretty deep relationships with the companies that we supported um, and we were running a 24 seven help desk as part of our services. Most of the companies that we worked with had my home telephone number. So even when they closed the doors and they literally closed the doors of the new facility that I had built and they, they, uh, they padlocked and chained the doors shut. Um, I was not privy to this. This decision was made over the pond in England. Um, they turned off our cell phones, they turned off our beepers, they turned off our 800 number. They basically abandoned all of our companies and all of our people. Wow. So I've got big companies calling me at home, Wells Fargo, Chase Manhattan, Chicago Transit Authority. Um, hey, do you, do you know your phones are turned off? Nobody's answering <laughs> the beeper. Um, hey, over here. <laughs> um, uh... It's not funny, unfortunately, but... <laughs> And so, you know, I'm sharing with them, Hey, I'm in the same spot. So I consulted. Well, can you help us? Can you help? Can you help share? Exactly. Can you help us? Yeah. Can, can, you, you, can you help it, us? It, can you take care of us? And I said, sure. Let me consult an attorney. I didn't have a non-compete. Um, I still had a home computer and a cell phone that I was paying for that I had access. I, I, you know, put contracts together, you know, multi-million dollar contracts with some of the biggest corporations in America to help them get through their Y2K woes. That was actually kind of our purpose is the parent company in England was supposed to deliver a Y2K compliant software for all these coin counters and all these cash machines and all these registers and things that were in banks. And these people weren't going to get that. Um, they still had all this hardware, but from a software perspective and all the data that they'd collected, where's that going to go? How am I going to do that? What am I supposed mm. to do with that? So I started a company and you know, I mean, and that's what they tell, that's what they tell entrepreneurs, find a need. Well, the need fell into my lap. That's great. <laughs> you know, I would have been an idiot to have ignored it. Yeah. So um, I, I started a company and, and took care of, of those clients and helped them find new software providers and do their data migrations and make sure that they had high quality data through that process. And eventually once Y2K was over, I kind of worked myself out of a job because that was my role was to, you know, move them into a Y2K compliant, happy place. So that was about the time my husband and I decided to move because we were like, oh, got a breaking point here. Let's, uh, uh, let's make a change. So. And by then you had been, by then you had a taste of being an entrepreneur and doing your own thing. So you just ran with it. I did run with it. I mean, when, when I moved to Colorado and actually before we even moved here, the realtor that we had found, she said, well, what do you guys do? And, you know, my husband's fairly flexible with civil engineering and things like that. So that wasn't as big of a deal. But when I told her I was in tech, she's like, you want to live here, here. These are where our tech hubs are. Um, and it's it's kind of uh, northwest of Denver. There's uh, kind of a tech hub on the way to Boulder. Uh, okay. Louisville, you probably mm -hmm. know that. Yeah. Or we say Louisville here. Louisville's in Kentucky. Um, and then that Denver Tech Center area. So. Right. Uh, we were able to uh, get, God, we bought almost the identical house in Castle Rock that we had in Iowa. Um, but we were able to get that for, of course, twice the price. And uh, I started going to uh, work for staffing agencies to learn about companies. So they would place me someplace. Um, they'd place me a couple other places. It took me a couple years to build up my network here. And then people were able to hire me direct. So it was a pretty easy transition, mm -hmm. uh, just rebuilding the network. And I mean, you know how Denver is. I, I keep forgetting that you're you're local as well. Yeah. Um, because I do I do national podcasts, but yeah. um 
Denver's so welcoming and, you know, they don't look at you like, ew, what are you doing here? Everybody was super nice and super welcoming and wanted to include you in this and include you in that. And it was really easy to get a foothold in the tech community here and to start making a difference. So that that was really how I was able to ramp back up under the same name. And I, I do good work. So I got lots of referrals. And I mean, that's the that's the best way to run a business. And why so. don't you tell it? Why don't you give the, the listeners of foxconsulting.co, by the way, foxconsulting.co. Why don't you give them the three minute elevator pitch on what what share does for for them? Go for it. Oh, you know, we're not a hard sell elevator pitch. People know when they need us. So we partner with companies really in various industries of various sizes, of various okay. locations on their data projects. And that might be organization-wide data strategies that, you know, change their culture. It might just be data governance frameworks that um, help them manage data in their, in their ecosystem more efficiently. It could be something smaller, which isn't really small anymore these days due to the amount of data we're, we're ingesting and how fat the volume that it's coming at us. Right. Yeah. It might just be a data quality initiative, which is a sub piece of a data governance framework, which is a sub piece of a data strategy that can still move their needle forward and help them, you know, help them implement trusted analytics, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So we're finding that as all the advanced hot new tech comes out, we're still preaching to everyone, you need high data quality, you need high data quality. Um, otherwise your data scientists who have, you know, PhDs are coming in and they're expensive data janitors. If you're feeding bad data quality into your artificial intelligence, it's gonna hallucinate, it's gonna make stuff up, it's gonna have bias. So, and you, God, you don't want to train your, your language models on bad data. So having bad data is actually worse than having no data in today's day and age. So we, we partner with companies on, you know, making sure they have really high quality data while we may be implementing data warehouses, data governance frameworks, business intelligence, analytics, and some of those other wonderful things that can propel companies forward. So it's, we're all about the data. Um, you know, people always ask me, you know, well, what's your ideal client profile and do they have data? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really simple question and uh, everybody has data. Every company in the world is a data company anymore. And mm -hmm. they all have really similar data, you know, financial data. It might not look and feel the same at a bank as it does at a heavy symbol engineering firm, but they both have chart of accounts. They both have to reconcile. They both have balance sheets in the end. It's the same data to me anyway, and, you know, and to my team. So, um, you know, if you've got customers, if you've got products, if you've got financials and you've got data challenges, whether that's, you know, I get pulled in a lot of times, our, our reports are wrong. Our analytics are wrong. Our BI is broken. Well, no, it's doing exactly what you programmed it to do. It's doing exactly what you told it to do. You've got a whole bunch of data problems upstream that we need to fix. That's why it looks broken downstream. So um, a lot of my referrals are writing uh, ships that are sideways and taking on water <laughs> or drowning. <laughs> so, um, you know, and we love those kind of challenges. Um Fortune 500 down to mom and pop small companies or? You, what, uh, you know, Fortune 500 and beyond. I God, I can't think. Uh, there have been some mom and pop companies, I guess you can say some family run companies um, that potentially don't exist now. You know, they've been sold or bought off. Um, we've we've had the pleasure of cleaning up after some of the messes that the big five leaves behind okay. um, or that some of our regional consultancies leave behind. Uh, we're often the last consultant in the door. Interesting. And you would think, you would think it'd be first. You, you want your clean, clean data to be able to do a bunch of other things. You would think you would be first. Well, I think I'm, I think I'm still a little bit of a hidden secret, even though I've been around for gosh, 27 years. Um, and we develop really, really strong relationships with our clients. Um, I have relationships with people at former clients and current clients. I've been to weddings. I've been to children graduating. That's good. I've been there through their divorces. I've been there through death. I mean, when you, when you do a project with a client, 
you go to war together. I mean, you really do. And whether they've got your back or you've got their back, you learn a lot of things about each other. And, you know, typically, especially in data, projects are 24 seven and we have to do things during downtime. I might be in the office working over the weekend to set up a new system. You know, the, the manager or the VP, you know, that I'm reporting to needs to have the confidence that I, I'm not treating it like a contract. I'm treating it like a real job that I really care about and that I really care about those people and that they come into, you know, a happy environment on Monday. And the same, the same goes, you know, the other way where, you know, if I picked up a bunch of 24 seven support one week and it wasn't really my week, that manager or VP might say, you know, Hey, Cher, I've got it this week. You really, you know, you really did your best effort for us last week and it wasn't even your turn. Um, you know, it, take the, uh, I've got it for you, please take okay. it off. So when you develop those kind of relationships, um, it's, it's definitely beyond the word boutique. Um, I, I helped a I helped a manager pick out an engagement ring for his fiance because I was the only female on his in his all male department. <laughs> and I'm a consultant. I was going to ask you if you if you consider yourself a boutique firm or how big the team is or you know what how do you do you have like a bunch of 1099 consultants? Do you have employees? Is it you? What what's the size of the organization? Yeah, so we have a really unique working arrangement. And sometimes I I am the lone wolf. I've been called that by several of my clients and it, it's just stuck with me. Um, but I, I do a lot of things for them, you know, that they don't have to worry about. Um, right now, I do have a team of about 10. Uh, we are servicing on an MSP out of Canada that has been feeding us uh, some data projects. Uh, all of them, uh, our, our agreement they are they all own their own company they are all experts in their industry and we basically work together as a collaborative so you. my yeah, clients good. are getting the best of the best instead of me saying mm -hmm. you know hey do you want to work with with share well great you have to go mm -hmm. through these junior people first or something we don't do that you know we we give them the the best of the best uh you know the top gun are you are you strike me as the sales and marketing and face and speaker of the company. Are you still doing tactical data work too, or are you just getting the gigs? No, my name is on the door. So I am, I am heavily involved in our client projects. Uh, okay. You know, if, if you're going to work with Fox consulting, you're going to work with the data Nista. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that was what I was wondering. I mean, I mean, you're doing all these speaking engagements. You're, your LinkedIn is, by the way, your LinkedIn page is one of the, first of all, you, you probably know this, right? I own a, RiderFlex is a recruiting firm, right? Like we, we're we recruiters for a living. The podcast is a side gig. So I'm, I, I look at LinkedIn profiles all day, right? And so as this morning, I'm getting ready for our podcast. I'm really going through your LinkedIn profile really well. I'm like, holy shit, this is, this has got to be in the top 10 most well-written profiles I've seen. It's really good. Like there, it's there's thorough. I don't know if well, it's yeah, well but that's good. I'll give it thorough. <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, I think, I think, and this is a great tip for the listeners. If I can just give this tip for the listeners real quick on that, on that. Um, and I know you give LinkedIn advice too. You know, if you want people to find you on LinkedIn, let the algorithms work to your advantage by putting in as much information as you can. You know, people think, oh, I don't want it to be too long. And I, and I always tell them, like, forget that. No, you want it. Listen, if a, if a keyword applies to you, make sure it's on there because that's how you're going to get found. So it, stop worrying about it being too long. And that goes for people's resumes, too. They're always like, oh, it should only be one page. I was like, I don't know. That's from 1960. Stop saying that. Like, you put yeah. the more words, the better. So yours is super thorough, is my point, and <laughs> very, very well written. So just so you know. Oh, Sheriff, Sheriff Fox, if you want to look her up in Denver, if you want to see a good, if you want to see a well-written LinkedIn profile, check out her LinkedIn profile. It, uh, it is, it's a thorough LinkedIn profile. And I've learned, I've learned how to put all of the things that I've done in various places. Yeah. I mean, obviously through Fox Consulting, it's very, I can't put all of that in the 2000 characters or less. So I've had to actually break up even my time under my own company, maybe yeah. per long-term client or, yeah. you know, highlights and, you know, play reels and things like that. Um, plus I'm, I'm a bit of a multitasker. So uh, when I was younger, anyway, I, I kind of just stick to 
my board of directorship for DEMA and, and Fox Consulting at this time. But I used to help girlfriends co-found companies so they could leave the corporate jobs that they hated. Um, and so I've been active in dance and cheerleading. I and, saw that. I saw and, that. And uh, spokesmodelship for lifestyle brands. I've been a band brand ambassador as a competitive bodybuilder. I mean, it's just all this crazy stuff that you maybe wouldn't think comes together. But oddly, it really did come together a little bit later in my career. So um, are your, it, are, your, are, your, are, your are your soup cans alphabetized and all perfectly faced in the cabinet? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I do have a little bit of OCD, um, which is a good thing when it comes to data. Uh, yeah, I, I do like things in their place. I, I'm guessing um, if, if your husband yeah. leaves something out of place, he's probably in trouble. He, he's not in trouble, but he does know it, it. it's aggravating. It's a challenge for me. So no, you know, I tell people LinkedIn yeah. is your resume on steroids. It's yeah. the opportunity. Oh yeah, for sure. For you to share all the things that really you can't put on a resume, volunteering, yeah. things that it. you're passionate about, um, things, things that you've maybe done a little sidebar. I mean, I'd have never thought all the shenanigans around dance studios and cheerleading teams and sports teams and all of that would actually help me get a marketing CEO role, uh, you know, but, but guess what, what's marketing today? It's data. It's all about data. Can you run a dev team that does websites and Google ads? Yes. Can you manage, you know, copywriters and social media people? Yes. All right. There's all this data around this, you know, in order for the client to feel good paying us for doing their marketing, we have to tell them what the data tells them. And, you know, that has to be factual. It can't be BS and it can't be, you know, blown up and mishyped, um, which is unfortunately uh, why the previous company's CEO got let go. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you, are you? A data, a data analyst, a marketing expert, a salesperson, an operations person. What, Sherry, you're all of the above. How do you, how do you rank, rank your functions? How do you rank your functional buckets? I guess data number one, but. Yeah, it, it really is still data number okay, one. Okay. I all mean, right. you know, as an entrepreneur, we have to wear a lot of hats. Sure. You you learn a little bit about operations. I mean, being being good with data helps me do my own accounting books and helps me do my husband's business accounting books, helps me with my clients, with their accounting books. So, I mean, data is data is definitely the number one thing. Um, I think I enjoy marketing a lot. I enjoy reaching out to people and seeing what rings their bell. I hate sales. I'm just, I'm not a salesy person. Um, it's something that I, I struggle with. And I think, I think our C-level people and our executives, they're smart enough to know based on your other, the other things you're doing, whether that's providing education, speaking at a conference, they're smart enough to know when they want to reach out to you and, you know, ask some questions and see if working together is, you know, in the cards. So, I don't, I don't reach out to people on LinkedIn with the intention of, you know, the, I don't hit the connect. And then as soon as they say, yes, send them the sales <laughs> pitch. It, that's not me. A lot of times I just thank them for connecting because the connection has a lot of value on LinkedIn. They're going to see my content. Sure, They're going to sure, see sure. where I'm speaking. Yep. I, it, you know, we, we talk about, we talk about utilizing LinkedIn as a tool to build trust and purchases from executives for their companies, whether it's their specific company as an entrepreneur or their, you know, Fortune 500 company, they're going to make that that decision to move forward based on trust and based on expertise. So I'm going to piss them off if I send a sales pitch right away. <laughs> they, they might unfollow me, you know, they might uh. unroll my bell at some point in time and go, I'm drinking from the fire hose here, lady. But, you know, it. By the way, it's hard by the for way, me to rank all of those things because I okay. still have to do my accounting every month and, you know, send it to my operations is still up there. I help my, uh, my husband and I co-founded a couple companies together. So I'm active in his ventures. I'm active with my DEMA chapter as the VP of marketing. 
And the reason that they asked me to do that is because they don't know a lot of data people that have that strong marketing crossovers. Sure. So, you're making me, you're making me tired. Just tell me. I get do tired. Ever, do you ever just <laughs> chill? Do you ever just, do you ever, when do you, do, do, do you ever just relax? I mean, you got so much going on. I mean, damn. <laughs> I, I do, but I, I enjoy giving back to the community and I'm a little, I'm a little up here in my own silo in Grand County. So I have to go to the city and interact with people. Um, I just spoke at West Slope Startup Week in Durango oh. and I met this beautiful pod of all these people over there that are, you know, they're starting startups and they're building tech companies and they're engaged in, you know, tech this companies. The tech companies are being built in Durango. You betcha. I didn't know that. You I didn't betcha. Know Really? All up that slope. Yeah. Gunnison wow. Wow. up okay. to Steamboat uh, in Craig. You betcha. So wow. all right. we tend to stay on our side of the mountains over here on the front range. <laughs> and we're not paying attention to some of the things that are happening uh, in Salida and Silverthorne and Steamboat Springs. Oh. Um, and over there in Durango and Telluride and Gunnison. And I think there's even a tech company in Crested Butte. So how about that? Okay. They're all over the place. So oh. I'm pretty sure... Sans the guy that fixes my Dell laptop from time to time. I'm the only other tech company in Grand County. So, <laughs> uh, pretty cool. No, how, you mentioned bodybuilding earlier. I just got to ask you: what, what were, were you uh, like a? a you, like were you, you're talking about competitive. You got trophies somewhere over there behind you somewhere. What, what, what's going on? Oh, they're Give downstairs. Me. They're downstairs in our gym. I thought about putting them behind me. I, I need to rotate my background from time to time. But <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I found, I found weights when I was in high school and it was something that I really just loved. Um, I loved, you know, hitting that next notch and being able to, you know, lift wow. the next heaviest weight. Um, when, when I was on my own, I, gosh, I was I was about 19 years old. I was working out at uh, one of the gyms that I would every now and again run across my husband at when he wasn't my husband at the time. Was he and in shape? Him, was was he in shape? Yeah, actually, we we compete together. Oh wow! All right, that, there was a connection. So, okay, yeah, um, yeah, you know, yeah, he was he was a wrestler in high school, ah. country. He was really active. I was pretty active in high school. I did volleyball. I did track. I did okay. softball. Um, okay. I, I was a collegiate dancer and cheerleader. So, um, okay. Okay. You know, cool. weights, weights, weights just kind of was something that was in my life. And I was working out one day and somebody walked up to me and said, I've never seen a girl lift as hard as you do in the gym. <laughs> Have you thought about competing? And I thought, ah, oh, no, I mean, oddly, I grew up around my dad having muscle and fitness magazines around the house. I knew who Arnold Schwarzenegger was. I knew a lot of who the girls were. I knew Corey Everson and Rachel McLish and some of the ladies that really made uh, female bodybuilding, you know, come up oh, that were wow. very, very fit and very attractive. You know, it's not the steroid look that we sometimes yeah. have yeah. with with the, the serious lady competitors today. So um, I grew up around that stuff. So it was really cool oh. to think about it. And I basically trained myself into my first show. Um, I could wear a swimsuit off the rack. It just, it wasn't that serious. It's Iowa. Let's, you know, let's get real about it. But I was, I was the only woman on stage doing bodybuilding. And Interesting. I liked it. And it was fun, but you know, then my career got sideways and I'm relocating to different places and going to the gym, you know, became a bit of a challenge. Um, and then what? I was a I was a professional dancer and cheerleader. So being fit was always part of that and important to that. And then uh late in my 30s, my husband asked me to hang up my pom-poms and my go-go boots. <laughs> and I said, Well, what the heck am I gonna do with myself? Because you know, I'm a busy lady. Um <laughs> and I said, well, why don't we, I said, I know of this fitness pro. Her name's Carla Sanchez. She was a Denver Broncos cheerleader. Um, she's got her fitness pro card. I said, Carla's got a competition coming up and they've got a couples uh, section. Why don't we hire some coaches and get in? So we did our first show together and then we did our next two shows together. My husband won his second show uh, master's level overall. So he's genetically gifted. 
Um, I would do twice as much cardio and lift twice as long as he would <laughs> just to try to stay, to keep uh, up with him. Yeah. Um, we actually have a commercial gym in the basement of our house in Grand County. Um, I typically, this week's been a little busy, but typically I've got time scheduled between one and three or two to four. I go downstairs and oh, good for you. Get, get my lift on just about every day. So what advice would you give uh, and as you get older, right, let's talk about, mm -hmm. let's talk, let, let's, it's let's definitely speak. changed each decade. <laughs> You're right. What advice would you give people like us that are starting to get up there now a little bit in age when you, you get up in the morning, you're like, damn, I don't know if I want to do my workout today. <laughs> what advice share to, give, give us some inspiration. So, I mean, when you get up in the morning and you're creaky, it's really the best time to go do some fasted cardio or go for a walk or go for a quick jog. It, it, it gets your body going. It gets some of the creakiness out, but it actually stimulates your brain because by getting your heart rate up, you're increasing your blood flow. So I find if I get up first thing in the morning and even do just a quick hit on our silly elliptical, it's like an elliptical and stepper mashup. Okay. Uh, but you can do high intensity interval training on it. It's got a 14 minute uh, session that you, you know, press the button and follow the prompts. If I do that, I'm, I'm awake. Good. I'm ready to go. Yeah. yeah. And ready. then, you know, I yeah. can go back down there in the morning and lift. I, I do know some people that can get up first thing in the morning, get some coffee in them and can hit the weights. I need two to three meals in me to hit the weights. So <laughs> I need food, I need sustenance. I think a big thing, especially as we age, and it's probably more important for women than it is for men, but it's becoming more, it's still very important for men. We have to lift weights. We need that for bone density. We need that to maintain our muscle mass because as our mm, hormones mm. decline, so does our muscle mass and it takes our bone structure with it. Um, you know, and there's a variety of ways that we can pharmaceutically enhance that or supplement enhance that and try to get through those, those tough spots. But we, lifting weights, even if it's next to nothing, um, you know, women think, oh. well, I'm, I'm going to get bulky. Well, you're not going to get bulky unless you do steroids or heavy levels of testosterone or okay. HGH, you know, that's what some of the celebrities do. And, and they stay, they stay fit well into their seventies and eighties, but, you know, grabbing those five pound weights, you know, just keeping the muscle moving and things like that. That's, it's super important as we age and will keep us off some of those bone density pharmaceuticals. Um, and you know, the various other pharmaceuticals that we need to age right. okay. comfortably, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to, as we get into, uh, the fourth quarter here of the chat, mm. uh, you, you know, you're involved now almost, but I mean, you almost kind of have to be right. You've, you've been, you were data, data, data science and data analytics, but now it's you know, all about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and these, these, these things that are happening. It's huge. It's the hot topic and everything. So you're around it, you're involved. You probably know more than the average person knows. Um, let me start with this, like the very first time you used chat GPT four, where you're like, wow. Okay. This is uh what was your reaction? <laughs> I held out for a really long time. Did you? Did <laughs> I did. You? Um, I, I did. I didn't. I didn't want to believe the hype. Um, oddly, in tech, because I've been in tech for so long, I've learned not to become the first adopter. Because ah, the first thing that's put out isn't always the best thing. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, that's computers, phones. Yeah, anything. DVD players. When DVD yeah. players came out, I'm like, I got a whole VHS collection. I'm yeah. good. You know, <laughs> now I know now I have multiples of various things, you know, but I still have, I still have VHS because our cable does go out here in the mountains and you have to have your entertainment. So, um, but I mean, just, we didn't. You know, even my husband, you know, he'd be like, oh, you know, should we get a DVD player for Christmas? And I'm like, ah, nah. But I was a late adopter of AI. I'm still learning a lot about it because okay. I actually don't work with clients that are utilizing it. They're not. They're 
really low levels of data quality. Um, you know, they've built maybe a beautiful analytics platform that nobody uses because they don't trust the data. So they're, you know, off in their offices spending time and money building workarounds and you know, meetings with different versions of the truth. So I think ChatGPT is, I think it's awesome. I think it has a lot of value. I don't think it's going to take our jobs. I don't think it's going to, you know, solve world peace. Um, I think that, I think it's got a place and some organizations are being really cautious around it, especially. And I hear that a lot at cyber conferences. Um, you know, we can't be, we can't be uploading our SQL code into this. We can't be uploading our, uploading our data sets into this. Um, we have to be very careful and cautious about how we use these technologies. Um, do, do I think that Skynet is real, that James Cameron was on to something in that Terminator movie? Maybe, but we, we can stop that. Like we should know that we've already been given the future, you know, it's already been prophesied. So, you know, I think we just, we need, we need to still be active in the process of implementing and managing these next generation technologies. And we still need to be holding the reins and the controls. So, um, you know, again, if I, I preach it constantly, I'll say it again, data quality, it's, it's number one. If you have low data quality and there are studies and experts out there I can quote, but if you have low data quality, you're not ready for all this other fun stuff. And, you know, it's the, it's the classic executive went to a conference, came back, started talking about, you know, started talking in all this new terminology and lingo he learned. Maybe he went to a case study where his competitor or, you know, a competitor talked about how this technology moved their, their organization forward. So this executive is like, oh my God, we're behind. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. I call it buzzword bingo. Like they start coming back and they start using all these terms that everybody in the company's like, what, what, what? And then if you, you know, if you make a grid, you could actually start stamping it out in a meeting, you know, how we talk, you know, it used to be boil the ocean and land the plane. And, you know, those to me are all buzzwords, you know, they're executive speak things that we hear in meetings. And you're like, can you just use words? Like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean I'm landing the plane? I'm not a pilot. <laughs> you know. So I think there's there's a lot of really great technology out there to harness, whether that's coming out in software products, tools, just improving processes in your company, um, putting in frameworks. There's there's a lot of time for all of those new technologies, but we're starting to hear the horror stories of well, we turned that on. It generated a bunch of garbage. We ran out of a bunch of storage. We got a big fat bill and now we have to turn it off. Mm. And I hate to see leaders mm. put themselves in those kind of positions mm. Mm. because if you walked around, you know, generating all that hype and that project failed, your butt might be on the line. <laughs> so, you know, I, uh. I'm still preaching the good old gospel word of ma good data management practices and, you know, doing it right the first time. Um, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of a lot of our company projects come to us. They're they're ships that are going under. I mean, somebody's left them in a lurch or the one data person that knew everything quit. Now, none of our stuff works. Um, it's expensive to. Yeah right a ship and tip it upright and let alone to move it forward um okay it's so expensive to re-engineer so so do, i do heard things you... right and put those technologies in the right spot in your you know okay. several year strategy okay very good thank you for that summary I, if i heard you right i i think i heard you say from a from a, a what's going to happen with ai i think i heard you say cool technology that needs to be managed and uh, needs to needs to probably have some sort of some some controls and legislation around it to keep it safe. Um, but you and you don't think it's going to take everybody's jobs. I think is is that a summary? Of what yeah. I heard. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, I hope you're right. Um, 
<laughs> it's, it's one it's one woman it's one mountain woman's uh prophecy <laughs> well you know i mean I, I have a lot of people on this show that answer that way on that question what concerns me is there's a lot of very smart people on the planet right now saying different things mm -hmm. um and uh you know and i'm like okay Boy, I don't know. I've heard, uh, I've heard, I've heard some very intelligent people, a lot smarter than me, that know about the situation that are uh, uh, sounding the alarm. Um, but then I meet people every day like you that say, "Ah, it's fine. Jobs are going to be fine." So you know, I, maybe it'll be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> I, I think, I think humans have to decide their future on that and, and their level of engagement on it. You know, and like you said, it's it's putting controls around it. And that's typically means governance. And that is coming from the data side. It's coming from the cybersecurity side. How yeah. do we govern this? Which in, you know, govern equals government, yeah. which yeah. feel like means restriction and limitations. But if we put the proper controls around it, it can be very enabling and very empowering. But humans have to decide, um, you know, what's the saying from Fight Club? You have to decide your level of uh, participation in the operation or something. There's some quote from that movie. I Project Mayhem. Okay. Yeah, Project Mayhem. You decide your level of uh, engagement in Project Mayhem. So, I mean, humans, we have to we have to upskill to understand it. We have to utilize it. We have to figure out where it fits and where it doesn't fit. Companies have to decide how they're going to control it so that their proprietary information doesn't get out. Right. So, yeah, that too. Sure, it's an enabler. Can it wipe the human race off the face of the planet? Maybe. Uh, I don't. Where's Sarah don't Connor? We, we, need, right? we Sarah need Sarah Connor. Connor. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, she's out there somewhere. Uh, she's in a phone she's out there somewhere. somewhere. But... Uh, it's a good, good conversation, Chair. So uh, one more time for the listeners. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you want to direct them to, but foxconsulting.co. Anything else you want to mention uh, as far as getting a hold of you or contacting the company? You know, they can surely reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm a heavy LinkedIn user, not just because I preach it. Um, you know, okay. there's the there's the quote from the hair club for men. I'm not only, uh, you know, the owner, I'm <laughs> I'm also a client. So <laughs> you know, I, I heavily use LinkedIn. Um, I get probably more direct messages on LinkedIn in a day than I do emails. So um, okay. it's, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I'm- All right. If you search for me correctly, you're going to find all sorts of good stuff, like some of my bodybuilding pictures that I didn't have control oh, over. Oh, I should have I should have pulled those up before. Now I'm definitely going to look for them now. I it's always a super great lead in when somebody calls me and is like, "Hey, I googled you, and I saw all your really great bodybuilding pictures." And I'm like, <laughs> so "Sweet, you've seen me in four eye patches and floss. What picture are you going to send me so we're on the same playing field?" Uh, so funny. Pretty good. Oh, uh, Cher, thank you for being on the Rider Flex podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was fun. Um, I've enjoyed yeah. some of your other sessions with other people, and I'm super honored that I was able to contribute.